Back in the day, give or take 600 years or so, there was a need to warn the public about dangerous threats to society. After all, you would want to know if somebody were to threaten your good Christian values, spread rampant disease and suffering, or even murder you. These women, <laughs> I mean witches, were often scolding, nagging, disobedient, and, God forbid, single. Thankfully, the media at the time was largely controlled by balladists, so news was covered on witchcraft and other topics by broadside ballads so the public was gratefully kept out of the evil dark. Thank God for that. In the late 1500s, Britain was doing pretty well. The Elizabethan era was kicking off, and the Tudor dynasty was in full swing. You had a steady population of people in the cities and an influx of poetry, drama, art, exploration, political intrigue, you name it. With all of these cultural achievements, there needed to be a way to reliably get day-to-day -day news to people. Enter the broadside ballad. This was a form of song that chronicled everything from crimes and murders to minor gossip and village scandals. They were printed on long sheets of single-sided paper called broadsides, and they typically had quatrains with an A-B-A-B -A -B rhyme scheme. There were tons of these, and yes, they were made to be sung. At the top of the broadside was typically the title of the piece, along with a suggested common tune to sing it to. Um, think about how, like, Mary Had a Little Lamb is a common tune to us today. It was something like that. So if you had an execution of a criminal coming up, rather than have a journalist taking notes at the scene, you'd have a balladist there, diligently noting everything to then translate into song and be widely distributed later. While broadside ballads were gaining popularity in the late 1500s, there was a simultaneous focus on one crime in particular, witchcraft. The plague was tearing through Europe, and with a lack of medical advancement, nobody really knew what was causing it or how to stop it. So that was very scary, and they needed to figure out a way to focus their energies and hysteria towards the uh, less trustworthy members of society, by which I mean women, especially ones who were disobedient to their husbands or fathers, old and single, young and single, or those who dabbled in the pagan arts of herbal medicine and healing. These were all suspicious things. If somebody was using medical practices and was a woman, well, you never knew what they were quite up to, so... There were several acts condemning witchcraft in the law, most of which demanded that a sentenced witch be hanged for their crimes, and that if they owned any goods or chattel, that those things would be forfeited to the state instead of passed on to a spouse or heir. This, for example, comes from one of the acts from 1562. Every such offender or offenders in witchcraft, enchantment, charm, or sorcery, whereby the death of a person or persons ensues, shall suffer the death as a felon or felons, and shall lose the privilege and benefit of sanctuary and clergy, saving to the wife of such person her title of dower, and also to the heir and successor of such person his or their titles of inheritance, succession, and other rights as though no such attainder of, su of the ancestor or predecessor had been had or made. I highlight this because the way these laws were written, there was an assumption that those committing the crime of witchcraft were actually men. This was a heteronormative society, so when it describes a felon's wife, the felon is a man. When it describes where his property goes, uh, it mentions the heir, a son, not a daughter. This is worth mentioning because while a couple of men were convicted of witchcraft, most people tried and executed were women. There's a reason the word witch has feminine connotations. Why was this? Well, there were a couple of reasons. Convicting someone of witchcraft was an excellent way to reinforce the status quo as a patriarchal society. Your wife wasn't listening to your orders around the house? Witchcraft. Your elderly crone of a neighbor was giving you the creeps? Witchcraft. 
It was a way of controlling the narrative of the day using mass hysteria, stirring up panic to make marginalized groups seem like the dangerous ones. For instance, if, for example, a marginalized people were to be exercising their right to peacefully protest, a way you could stir up hysteria in the media and being the powers that be, you could accuse them of looting or inciting violence. That's just a hypothetical situation. Laws and acts were all good and fun, but how do you ensure that laws stay followed at the local level? How do you make sure that the proles at the bottom of the societal food chain remain good little soldiers in our war against witchcraft? I mean, it's not like they had Twitter or cable news to keep them up to date. Now what they did have was balladists at the local markets or the pub down the street. Of things most strange we every day do hear, yet things more strange than usual do appear. As by my story I shall relate, I'll let you know without the least deceit. Wizards and witches have too well been known by hellish arts and trouble many a one. Some by lad torment sorely were oppressed. Ballads were accessible. Even if someone couldn't necessarily read, they'd be able to listen to their local balladist recount the news at the marketplace, at the pub. In the excerpt you just heard from A Cure for Witchcraft, the balladist recounts a local girl falling gravely ill. Her friends go to a local chemist who diagnoses that she's been bewitched and creates a poultice made of the sick girl's own urine with some other herbs and chemicals, then instructs her friends to go to the scene where they suspect she was bewitched. They go to the Blue Boar Inn, which I think might still exist today, there's an inn in the area mentioned uh, called the Blue Boar, but it doesn't look like the more historical images of it. I mean, I suppose rebuilding is a thing. Um, the modern Blue Boar has a DJ party every Friday, and they even warn guests on their website that music will be blasting till midnight, so it sounds pretty cool. So anyway, the girl's friends go to the inn with this weird bottle, and they wait up all night long. There's this old woman that comes along, and she is the witch. Or at least that's what the ballad says. Um, and she tries to take the poultice from them, threatens to curse them, and so then they kill her. Uh, it's kind of glazed over the details of this. I guess they wanted to spare the gory details of actually murdering an old lady. Um, but she was a witch, so it was fine. Only after the witch is dead does the girl start to heal from her ailments. You have a couple staples of reinforced patriarchy here. For one thing, the image of a virtuous young girl, untouched by the cruelties of the world, falls ill in a very unfair manner. Knowing she's done no wrong, it must be witchcraft, because illness only happened at that time if you, were, if you had, you know, sinned and were under God's wrath, or the wrath was bewitchment, or your humors were out of balance, which usually was also a moral failing. So she needs to be saved, because this girl is a delicate flower, and justice must be had. Clearly, only the old crone could have done such a thing. The girl's friends have to go and protect her, and there's sort of a damsel in distress through line happening here. I wonder what it must have been like for the old woman. Imagine going to a popular pub in your hometown, and the, you see a bunch of dudes chilling by what would have been the dumpster in the back. Sitting in a circle, and they have this weird bottle that smells weird and looks weird, and... You know, when the ballad says she tried to take it from him, I wonder if maybe they saw her, accused her of witchcraft instantly, and maybe she said something like, That's ridiculous! Give me that thing so I can throw it away! And there was a scuffle where she probably yelled at them because they were being whack as heck. Or who knows? Maybe they just jumped the first old woman they found because they still they had a stakeout all night and then reported it to the balladist the next day. 
I mean, there weren't any other witnesses, so who was going to contradict them? Then they kill this old woman, and because she's an old woman, and she's this weird person in society, and then later, right after, their friend happens to heal from the common cold or her kidney stone or whatever she had, they're all like, aha! But the ballad is still like... As soon as this witch's life did end, the girl immediately began to mend. And they that question what's inferred here, to Hallborn go, and the truth shall appear. O oh God, preserve us from such wicked fiends. Protect our persons and our nearest friends from cursed witches and such fiends of hell who joy when they in wickedness excel. So there you have it. Of course, there are other examples of witchcraft in ballads at the time. One such example of a ballad involving witchcraft was A Warning for Wives, which was written somewhere around 1629 to the 1630s. It involved a woman named Catherine Francis, who was essentially seduced or controlled by the devil. She killed her husband, and then she was put to death. In a similar example, The Unnatural Wife narrates the story of Alice Davis, who very similarly um, killed her husband and then was burned at the stake. In both cases, they are considered unnatural or witchy women, murderous women, nagging women. All of these words were typically synonymous with that witchcraft association. It might seem a little strange that it was only necessarily women who murdered their husbands in these extra examples that I'm bringing up, though it was always considered an incredibly strange and devilish, demonic thing that a woman could just randomly turn on her husband when women were supposed to be very submissive and obedient and kind and uh, waiting on their husbands. So for one to turn around and just murder him, it always seemed a little out of the blue and a little supernatural. Broadside ballads were a tool for spreading the news. While they actually did depict real-life events that were happening, much like the news of today, they were also a tool for propaganda and spreading messages to mirror the political interests of the ruling class. We look back on things like witchcraft and witch trials and they seem like outlandish, kind of silly things, but through the diligent documentation of the time, we're able to see in intimate and firsthand accounts what everyday people thought of such things. and. Hindsight is twenty twenty. so while these things seem a little silly today, I think it's important to look at our own news sources and ask ourselves how much of it is orchestrated by the powerful in order to silence the marginalized. I mean, luckily today, we are able to check our sources, so to speak. We have a lot of extra footage beyond what the major news sources will put out there. I can't imagine what these types of ballads and stories would look like had that old woman had a cell phone and been able to record her experience at the pub. Unfortunately, we don't have that, but still, it's something to keep in mind. Thank you for watching. Of things most strange we every day do hear, yet things more strange than usual do appear. As by my story I shall relate, I'll let you know without the least deceit. Wizards and witches have too well been known by hellish arts and trouble many a one. Some by lad torment sorely were oppressed and some to death bewitched. This is no jest. Not far from London, as the story tells, a girl that was bewitched in health now dwells, who while the witch survived, no ease could find, but vexed in body and perplexed in mind. Her friends were troubled for to see her so, but how to help it they no means did know. 
Nature obliged, they increased, her strength declined, her pains too great, they thought for to endure, yet they poor souls for her could find no cure. From one unto another they were sent, until at last they to a chemist went, who was well known to have a great art and skill, and strove the minds of patients to fulfill. When they to him their business had been made known, quoth he, I pray you let me now alone. My greatest skill in art I now will show to ease this girl of this tormenting woe. The girl's own urine he then bid them take, and with some other things a mixture make, which being put into a bottle, then he ordered them the matter, the place, and when. They should this bottle in the dunghill put, which he believed the witch's charms would cut. This thing they were all resolved to try, hoping to find some help immediately. The 27th of March, they did begin to try this fancy at the Blue Boar Inn, a place in Holborn known exceedingly well. Neat this we may conclude these people dwell. So coming to this play, they straight away went. To try this thing was wholly their intent, and in the dunghill there was a hole made, the bottle with the ingredients in it was laid. This being done, they filled it up again, and by this dunghill they did all remain, as if no other thing they had to do, but to divert the time to work they go. And their intent was carefully to see, after this bottle, that it there might be, and not be touched or meddled with at all. This thing admired was great and small. All night they stayed and carefully did watch, and in the morning came this wicked wretch who did this girl bewitch and presently asked for the bottle which they did deny much swelled then she did appear to be and the hellish looks for she had undoubtedly this bottle she was forced to go without the, her hellish curses then she thundered out but of her curses they were not afraid nor nothing seemed at her to be dismayed. But in short space, it was certain laid dead, and tidings brought them what this witch was. As soon as this witch's life did end, the girl immediately began to mend. And they that question what's inferred here, to Hallborn go, and the truth shall appear. O oh God, preserve us from such wicked fiends. Protect our persons and our nearest friends from cursed witches and such fiends of hell who joy when they in wickedness excel.